I'm not sure. There we go. I think she can see me and hear me now. Hello, friends. Hello. How are you? <laughs> good. We're good. We just wrapped up that great discussion here, and now I'm going to throw it to you for the introduction of our next panel. Wonderful. Thank you, Sonia. So it is now my pleasure to introduce our next panel, The Future of Electric Vehicle Innovation, moderated by Monica Minerson, Accenture Strategy and Consulting for Industry X. Please make your way to stage two. Thank you sincerely, Jamie, uh, for the introduction. As mentioned, my name is Monica Menarkin and I'm an executive with Accenture's Industry X, Innovation and Thought Leadership Practice here in North America. Industry X's mission is to support clients in the design and operation of new engineering and manufacturing business and product models, agile service development and services. But my passion is supporting mobility clients in the design and operation of new business models and mobility services for connected, automated, shared and electrified vehicles. But if I were to plainly state what I do, I'm a digital strategist who strives to help my clients innovate, seeing the possibilities of what is not and making the best version of what could be. Creating a mindset to continually advance the paradigm, challenge existing constructs and constraints, and to willfully experiment. In other words, make innovation routine and boring. So that leads me to our discussion today. What will the next transformation in vehicle technologies be like? Autonomous is one word used, shared is another. And will it be connected? Of course. It sounds all exciting, and we've all seen electrified vehicles out there. The directions being proposed are a very good starting point to look even further and ask the question, what might mobility look like in the year 2030, or even 2040 or 2050? The existing automotive paradigm is being challenged by CASE, connected, automated, shared, and electrified. Each in itself are indicative of a megatrend able to stand on its own and alter our world in unimaginable ways. However, each has a synergy which draws on each case element and it draws it together and in its heart, many argue is electrification. Besides the obvious ecological reasons used to support the advent of electrification, electrification is really a glue that accelerates the three other mega trends. So what can we actually do in order to accelerate the race towards electrification of the vehicle? This is a crucial question. In that light, I would like to introduce my esteemed panel. So with that, could I turn it over to Colin to introduce himself? <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, Monica, thank you for that. And um, a huge thank you to Cav and Sonia and the whole team there in Ottawa. Um, it's a shame I wasn't able to travel up, um, but uh, delighted to be here. I am the Chief Technical Officer at the Automotive Parts Manufacturers Association of Canada, and I'm also tasked to be a lead on Project Arrow, which is Canada's first um, concept prototype passenger vehicle. And uh, absolutely delighted to be on the panel today. And now Michelle. Hi, hello, Michelle Avery here, calling in from the Bay Area, Menlo Park, California. And also, yeah, big shout out to Sonia and Mike and everyone at Area XO and Best Ottawa. Do incredible work. Really, really important work with just that high level of, of ethics and moral grounding that we really need, especially when we talk about making autonomous vehicles safe for the public roads. Um, I worked with them when I was at the World Economic Forum, heading up um, automotive and autonomous mobility. And now I'm the vice president of product and strategy, along with government affairs at Inride here in North America. And if I could have just a minute to tell you just a little bit about Inride, you know, our whole purpose for existing is to reduce CO2. And the way that we are going to do that is by offering four services in the United States. We do offer them globally as well. The first is a connected electric truck. 
The second is an autonomous electric truck. The third is charging infrastructure because both trucks need it. And in the US, we also have, I bundle in wireless connectivity because in the US, we know that that's not bulletproof. It's not uh, ubiquitous and persistent as we would like it to be. So we help solve that problem. And the fourth thing is the digitalization platform that we call Saga. And Saga does a couple of things. One, it optimi optimizes our fleet of connected electric trucks and autonomous electric trucks. And these are our trucks. We offer our services, our trucks as a service for shippers in uh, the US. But the other thing it does is it digitalizes the supply chain. And that is vitally important as we move into the future. Right now we provide our shipping services for short haul middle mile. We don't do specialized or long haul, which is actually really ideal for the way that those technologies are capable today. So these are not things we have to wait for far out in the future to be utilizing now. Thank you, Michelle. And now I'm going to toss it over to Bayview Yards. Um, okay. and so, um, <laughs> uh, my, my name is Devashish Paul. I'm uh, CEO and founder as well as garbage man and dishwasher at Blue Wave AI. Um, so um, well, uh, Blue Wave AI is based here in uh, Ottawa. And uh, I think four years ago, I was sitting around with Sophie Chen here in the audience. And I was like, hey, you know, we got all this cloud computing, AI, networking, software as a service, manpower and intelligence here in our community. And the whole world of uh, energy and uh, transportation electrification is evolving. So why don't we uh, make a world leading company here in Ottawa uh, to kind of ride on this whole transformation of decarbonization. So what uh, Blue Wave AI does is uh, we take data out of our customer system. So their electricity utilities, fleet operators and large industrial customers. And we predict, optimize dispatch and control how more renewable energy can be used in all of these systems in real time, like 24 seven. So if you take five minutes, there's 105,000 five minute blocks a year. And uh, some guy is not gonna stand around and press buttons uh, 105,000 times a year. So the, the thing you wanna do is automate it and deploy AI techniques. So my background came from the supercomputing and AI and networking side of things. And I realized that there's all this like distributed assets in terms of the hardware, the solar panels, the wind farms, the electric vehicles, and there's data coming out of all of them. And so then how do you, how do you make heads or tails of all of that and best utilize, um, best utilize the, the, the renewable energy and, uh, and, and use less diesel and carbon, uh, basically carbon emitting energy. And it's a, it's a problem that's ripe for uh, big computing, uh, big computing and distributed computing. And here in our community here in Ottawa, we, we, we have everything you need to go do that and win around the world with. And once we get into the panel, I'll give you a few examples to compliment the other speakers. So thanks. Thank you very much. So with that, let's kick off the panel. Um, so I'll start with our first question. So many see a really bright future for electric vehicles. Um, for panelists, I would like to say, could you mention what you think are the top challenges for getting more electric vehicles out on the road? And what are the challenges from within the industry? Sure, uh, I'd love to start with that one since we have trucks on the road now all over the world. And the one thing I can tell you about electric trucks is the demand far outweighs the supply. And this is also very true for autonomous electric trucks. If we could make more of them, we could have them operating now. There's just that much demand. So this is not something that we actually have to wait for in the near future. And part of this is because the market that we're tackling is that short haul and that middle mile freight and that's a huge market and it also happens to be really ideal for electric vehicle. so let me give you an example if you were to from 
uh, the Port of Long Beach to the railhead in Los Angeles, do that three times round trip. That's about 130, 150 miles. You can do that on a single charge now with a, a truck. And that's a perfect place. Not perfect for autonomy, mind you, but it's really great for a human driven electric truck. And we all know that electric trucks are a lot more pleasant to drive than a diesel internal combustion engine truck. They're easier, they're a lot more pleasant. And I think that that can actually drive a little bit more demand for truck drivers. But also for the autonomous electric truck, there's a lot of, of use cases like what we launched with General Electric Appliances and talked about in early November, where we're operating these trucks at low speed to really help solve some of the bigger problems they have with one driver in one truck, which really limits their ability to move a lot of their washing machines and dishwashers from their manufacturing line to their distribution center. If you flip that on its head, and do that autonomously, and then have a remote truck driver monitoring that fleet, you can then move from one truck driver to four trucks, one to 10, and then you're actually taking those very, very valuable skills of that truck driver and not being limited by the machinery. And so those are the things that I think are the greatest opportunities, and also frankly, some of the challenges as well. Getting enough trucks, making sure we have the clean renewable energy where we need it, but then also helping really work with the labor force on applying those skills in different ways. I'd like to, uh, to add to that Monica by saying charging sure. infrastructure, you know, it's, um, it, it, you know, electric vehicles as uh, Michelle was mentioning, uh, you know, whether they're, um, commercial vehicles or passenger vehicles are an absolute delight to drive. Um, but I'll tell you, uh, I'm an owner of an electric vehicle and uh, I don't take it to Ottawa um, because I have to plan my route, even though my Tesla will plan it for me. Uh, I would rather jump into a gas guzzling internal combustion engine vehicle and know that I'm basically uh, filling up when I leave Ottawa and then heading back. So I, I think Charging infrastructure is going to be critical, uh, which is obviously something that uh, I would say involves here in Canada, municipal, provincial and federal governments, as well as the private sector. Um, but I also think uh, from our end, uh, from a manufacturing and from the industry side, it's the charge times. You know, uh, currently today, a fast charge may be 30 to 50 minutes. Um, and I think we are working towards that magic under five minutes. And if you read some of the articles that are coming out globally, uh, certain companies and organizations feel they're very close to that. But I think, um, you know, we've culturally gotten used to, you know, filling up gas tanks or, you know, getting your vehicle going within minutes. So I think that has to be a key aim. So I think expanding the charging infrastructure and making sure that you can charge it within minutes as opposed to closer to a half an hour or an hour. take a cut from two angles so one uh, one angle would be the consumer side and the other side is uh is uh the commercial fleet operate operator side so i think on the commercial side perhaps all of you in the audience probably have your personal idea of why you have or have not adopted an electric vehicle but let, let me share some of the dynamics from the operations from the uh from the commercial or municipal fleet side so um, as the other panelists mentioned, you don't just kind of walk up to your electric truck or bus and magically fill it up. Uh, it, it's a long duration event when you're charging up. So now imagine you're tr trying to uh, manage, let's say, a local UPS fleet or, you know, the future OC Transpo fleet here in Ottawa. You now have electric vehicles. You have your legacy diesel powered vehicles, and you're not about to just dump those. You're gonna, you're gonna run them through to their sunset in terms of uh, the lifetime of the existing assets. And you're gonna onboard all these electric assets. So now uh, I'll uh, share a quote from my colleague at MV Transit. MV Transit 
runs 200 agent uh, transit operations in cities around the US and Canada. And in a city that will remain nameless, he said, you know, basically they, they got a pilot of electric buses and the operators don't want to use them, right? They're, the, the electric buses are sitting over there in the corner and the guys are like, look, all of this computer stuff, it's just too complex for me. I just want to pour the gas and I'm sending the bus out. So those electric buses are in the parking lot in a nameless city in Texas, um, gathering dust. Not quite. They, they, they get sent out on short routes where you're kind of certain that, you, you know, like there's a football game going on and the, and the fans are going to get to the stadium. And if it's long routes or complex operations, it's kind of iffy. So basically what you have now is you got – all of these fleet opera, uh, all of these electric buses are an extension of the building when they're charging. So, so you, you got the grid connection into the building that's limited and the buses have to take turns charging at the depot. In effect, they have to get in line, but on the flip side out on the road, you got to send these things out and actually service your transit routes or, or, or like if you're a delivery company, you got to deliver parcels. So if you can't provision it with electric, you're sending out diesel. So there's a lot of history in terms of understanding how you deploy diesel vehicles. And there isn't a lot of history and data on how to onboard these electric vehicles. And there is resistance across uh, uh, fleet operators all around. Um, we have mayors and boards of directors going, yes, we will greenify our fleet and we'll onboard this many vehicles. Meanwhile, the operations guy down in the shop is like, all right, well, that, 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 that's what they're declaring up there, but I got to actually run this thing. And so that's somewhere, I mean, obviously this is kind of leading into what we're experiencing in the field. That is somewhere that's uh, an area that's ripe for automation to enable that onboarding and basically take on more electric vehicles. I was literally looking at a graph today for a transit agency in Canada, and they're planning to go to fully electric in 2035, so roughly 14 years from now. And I talked to uh, the, the person at the agency, and I was like, this, this is really conservative because you're worried. Let us, ex let, let us simulate for you how you can onboard faster. So there's a lot of worry in terms of onboarding uh, the electric vehicles and just getting familiar with them. You know, I'd really like to echo some of those comments. Um, you know, you're absolutely right. That digitalization can be very scary. That's part of why of our four products that we're bringing to market is that digitalization platform to help solve those really pragmatic problems. Because while operating an electric truck is more pleasant, it is different. And we recognize that. And we recognize that you need to really think about how you're doing your planning and how you do your utilization different. And those are the very, very in the weeds, down in the trenches problems that we're solving for our shipping customers now. And that's what we're signing up to do. So you don't have to wait to 2030. That's really heartbreaking to me. When we think about how much CO2 we can be reducing now, we need to move a lot faster. And if that requires a mix of legacy analog systems, as we bring people on board to the digital systems, then we need to really get busy. <laughs> we need to get busier now. Which also gets back to my point that the demand far outstrips the supply, which is something that we're working very, very hard to, to, to deal with right now. So I'm going to maybe change up the conversation now here a little bit and say, okay, so we have this problem. So when you look to successful innovations in other markets that, or, um, you know, other spaces, right? Are there any examples that jump to mind that have shown like the best roadmap to follow here or even within vehicle, you know, this domain, right? Um, are there any pitfalls that you like to highlight for others that we should be specifically involving? Like, is there a best in class pathway forward to get more electrified vehicles out there in the market? 
you know, if I if I could start, uh, Elena, electric vehicles are electrons, and whether they're developed and produced through hydrogen fuel cells, or whether they're done through, you know, prismatics or pouches or cylindrical cells, like there is so much that has to be uh, flushed out. From a passenger vehicle standpoint, you know, we've got cylindrical cells, we've got prismatics, we've got pouches, and uh, you know, around the corner is solid state. And the one thing the auto industry has been pretty good at over the last hundred or so years is flushing out uh, and trying to come to a global standard. Um, I would say, um, you know, um, you know, little old me would say that we should be looking at cylindrical cells versus pouches or maybe prismatics for passenger vehicles. Um, let's put all our efforts into that, knowing knowing that solid state is probably less than five to seven years away from being introduced. It's already being introduced by Canadian companies like Blue Solutions from Boucherville on commercial vehicles for Mercedes and Renault. Um, and so why would we want to you know, waste our efforts uh, and instead bring together best practices uh, around lithium ion? And, and yes, let's play with the chemistry. Let's add in silicon. Let's add in kind of graphene to make those cylindrical cells better and more efficient. But I would say, you know, some of the best practices should be around, you know, only the battery cells, but also the energy management, the battery management systems as well. Because if you own a Tesla, you'll know that, you know, you purchased it with, let's say, 500 kilometer range. And with a software over the air update, you suddenly have an extra 15 kilometers. Hold on. You know, I still have 8000 cells. I still have the same technology. How did I suddenly get? And, and, and that's where, um, you know, as has been mentioned by my colleagues, that's where the digitization of the technology is making a difference. Uh, and so, you know, but I think there should be a focus and a best practice that we should all follow. Add something here. So uh, maybe so we can get some context. I'll rewind something like uh, 25 years, and uh, there's a Motorola flip phone. There was a uh, Kodak digital camera. Uh, there was a uh, pager. There was a Palm Pilot PDA, and these were all like discrete systems that didn't talk to each other. And then I kind of expected like Motorola or Nokia. Sorry, sorry if any of you guys are from those companies. I, I thought one of those companies would actually take all of these disparate systems and integrate it into one holistic experience for the user. Um, but there was like some startup from Waterloo that, you know, had like kind of a crappy pager that then integrated all those things and made a holistic user experience called a smartphone. Now, subsequently, others basically built on that market, but for roughly a period of 15 years, they basically created this market, which was taking all these disparate uh, uh, electronics and gadgets with uh, with the diverse user experiences and integrate into one system. And that's actually what we're seeing, not at the consumer level, but at the fleet level. Uh, what we have now is we have uh, uh, fleet management software, energy management systems for the buildings. We have charging control systems. We have other software systems that predict like real time energy market pricing and energy from you know, wind and solar contract and so on. You'll always see like Apple and Google buying all kinds of, uh, of, of wind and, and solar energy. And you have all these disparate pieces on top of which you have data coming out of now legacy buses getting metered and electric buses and trucks getting metered. And all of this data flowing into diverse user platforms. Now to to bring it all together to make the best holistic decisions requires a, an understanding of how each one affects the other. And the onboarding of the electric vehicles will become much quicker once these type of problems are overcome. And um, we see kind of, uh, we see it from a, a data and computing angle versus a uh, vehicle operation angle, which we then, feed back into the, the, the vehicle operation angle, which should allow fleets to much more aggressively onboard these as supply, as supply and manufacturing uh, picks up. And, you know, obviously the market cap of some EV stocks are, uh, are a clear indication of, of, of that pent up demand and upcoming, uh, 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 you know, consumer buying beyond the commercial or the, 
or the personal vehicle side. That's really great. I, I appreciate the way that you frame that. For me, when I think about successful innovation, it's the one that gets used. It doesn't matter if it's superior in the way it was engineered or designed. If it isn't used, then it doesn't matter. And I think that what is often lost in the path towards innovation is the human. And what does it mean for us? And how are we going to apply it? And how are we going to use it? Not just to make our lives better, but also to improve our productivity, our efficiency, and our utilization of our scarce resources that we have on this planet. So when I think about some of the things that we need to be doing better in this space is we need to be talking about circularity. Now we know from cybersecurity that the best cybersecurity is the one that is security by design. And then you're constantly monitoring and improving it. And I think that's the same when we, we talk about EVs is we need to really think about circularity by design. We need to be really breaking down the way that we have always done business and fundamentally change the business model. It's wonderful that there are a lot of great um, technology innovators and um, roboticists and electrical engineers creating wonderful products, but some of them are looking for a business model or looking for a problem to solve. There are enough real problems now that we need to be solving. And I think that's where we need to be looking is, is to solve those problems and to do it with circularity, full recycling from the beginning through, or we're not gonna get there, no matter what the shape of the battery is. We need to, to look at all of that, those pieces to it. Um, there's technology evolving and there's um, existing business practices. So I have an example of one of the major uh, 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 delivery companies in the world. Uh, who would like to uh, start onboarding electric, but there is no electric truck or van that fits into their form factor. So you got these small kind of Mercedes Sprinter vans, and then you got the classic truck, mm -hmm. the big, huge ones. And the in-between form factor that the delivery companies use, mm -hmm. no one wants to, I shouldn't say no one wants to build Send those. Send them my way. <laughs> Give me, give me their names and their numbers and let's talk because we yeah, can and actually so, help yeah. solve some of these problems. Exactly. There's one angle where uh, someone's got to build something that's electric that fits perfectly into the, in quotes, legacy business systems. Mm -hmm. Or the business systems can evolve to onboard a different form factor uh, and, and figure out how to use those more efficiently than before. Now, it takes time to change business practices. Um, we have a uh, uh, project ongoing with Alaska Airlines who've onboarded 450 electric uh, vehicles for all their underwing vehicles. So an underwing vehicle is something that doesn't fly, you know, all those things that drive around on the ground in the airport. And they'd like to onboard actually more of those. And so they're having to change their whole business practice on how those things get deployed to service a vehicle because their old way of doing it, which was based on pouring diesel, doesn't work with electric. Mm -hmm. uh, well, the, the great solution to that is a business model, is to have really killer unit economics, and people will change their business practices all day long to take advantage of those. We're, we know for a fact that electric trucks have a lower total cost of ownership than an internal combustion engine. Yeah, you have to change your processes, but the unit economics are so compelling that it makes it worthwhile. So for someone like us, like Enroy, we're lucky enough to not only offer phenomenal products that answer sustainability, but also do it with a really, really compelling business model. And we do recognize that it does mean changing processes, but we're more than willing to partner to help ease that transition. Okay, I'm going to maybe twist this a little bit since we're going down this way. So I think I'd like to ask the panelists, and I think I'll start with Colin with you with this one. Um, why are we associating connected and autonomous technology so much with electrified, electrified vehicles? And why do we always make that connection? And what does that mean? 
you know, here, <laughs> you know, as an accelerator. I, I think we've, uh, Monica, we've kind of touched upon it, um, you know, briefly by talking about the digitization of the segment sector, um, the electrification of the segment sector. Uh, you know, um, I don't want to plug uh, Tesla because they don't pay me any royalties for doing so. But the reality is, is uh, Elon's never described his car company, his company as a car company or an automotive company. Rather, he describes it as a technology company. Mm -hmm. You know, the presentations I've been given over the past few years, uh, I always tend to hold up my cell phone and go, your car today, uh, put four wheels on this, and it has more in comparison with this than it does a vehicle from the 1990s. Mm -hmm. And that really starts to sink in because we're moving away from analog to digital. And, and because of that movement from analog to digital, there is that assumption um, don't get me wrong, there are Cadillacs on the road that I believe have better ADAS than a Tesla today, yet their, their engines are, well, they have engines, it's internal combustion engine, but we automatically assume AV to be joined with EV. Um, and, and, and it's positive. It, it works well for the EV segment. You know, they are milking it. Let's, let, let's be clear on this. But it's also because, you know, we are trying to kind of, you know, I'd say, you know, work f away from, you know, having a single computer on a car 15 years ago to today, a premium car has between 100 and 150 ECUs. You know, you start to begin to understand how, uh, you know, the digitization of your braking system, of your steering system, of your kind of, you know, your uh, sensory intelligence systems, your now your battery systems, all begin to be aligned. What happens for the average person on the street, though, is they see a vehicle, a shell, and they see four wheels, and they don't understand it. But I think mm -hmm. those of us, and typically the panel here, who are kind of more in the background, mm -hmm. we see and, and, and we and we understand the correlation between the two. Uh, and um, you know, we are at what level four this year in autonomy. Uh, mm -hmm. Honda announced in January they have a vehicle which is level four, mm -hmm. which in theory means it's level five. The only difference between the two is one has steering wheel right. and pedal and the other one doesn't. And so to be at level four technology, and the one thing I've always said, and I wrote an article two and a half years ago called Smart Cars, Dumb Infrastructure, mm -hmm. and it was really about V2X. It was saying, look, if we all want to see autonomy of coming to our vehicles um, sooner than later, then you have to start adding in intelligence into your infrastructure as well. Mm -hmm. You have to start adding intelligence into what Dev and, and Michelle and Colin are wearing as we're walking through this uh, ecosystem. Mm -hmm. And so all of these things, I think, are literally bringing together. And again, I'll finish off with where I started with electrons um you know and mm -hmm. uh, and the digitization yes. um, <laughs> yeah, building on uh, the vehicles are basically computers with wheels that move humans around um, over in dubai so we got a project with dubai taxi they got five thousand taxis on the road uh of which today 200 are electric and what they're um you know that their previous 5,000 taxis were not really uh, very well connected. Now these ones are, are, are well connected. And what's going on is uh, they're acquiring all of this data from the road images, acceleration, deceleration, traffic, and so on for multiple years. And feeding that into a few different places. One is basically to build a path to autonomy. Mm -hmm. The second one is to build a path to onboarding more electric taxis. And the third one is build a path to more energy efficiency of that autonomous, largely electric fleet of taxis over multiple quarters. Right now, they're thinking about onboarding about 100 electric taxis a month and gradually decommissioning all their Camrys and so forth. And they're getting vehicles from multiple vendors, not just Tesla, but a variety of, uh, of, of, of vehicle vendors from the Far East. And building up that whole data set so that they can move towards that path to autonomy with energy efficiency. But also the, the other part that we've worked with them on is 
with, with, with that data, figuring out for them how to maximize revenue while minimizing cost structure. So it's like, put the right taxis in the right place in, in Dubai, where they're going to maximize revenue while having electrified miles versus diesel miles. And today, in effect, they have infinite charging capacity for the amount of electrified they have. Once they get to 3,000, that, that, you know, the taxis are now doing the same thing as in Alaska Airlines, getting in line for their turn to charge. So all of this requires very quick learning of how to use your system. And there's no way that humans sitting around in the taxi ops center are going to figure out the best way in a span of like, let's say six to eight quarters, what they will eventually know in 20 years from now. So there isn't time to best learn all of that stuff. So they need to actually capture the data and then develop the new algorithms and systems to deploy based on that data. So the connectivity, the data acquisition, the best decision making that ensues from that are, are really critical to um, um, to the fast onboarding. Otherwise, it's going to take them forever to, to onboard. And then at some point, um, uh, Michelle was talking about LA not being the best place for autonomous, but in a, uh, in a, in a, in a country like Dubai, it is easier for them to flip to autonomous than uh, uh, you know, a, a, a Western city that, uh, that where, where there's eight regu uh, levels of government regulation to get to autonomy. It's a bit quicker in a jurisdiction like that. Well, please don't take my words out of context. <laughs> I didn't say Los Angeles as an entire city in a basin was not good for autonomy. So, so please don't, don't put that one on me. But Monica, I really appreciate this question because I think there's a lot of confusion about it. And it's important to know that autonomous systems don't need connectivity. Electric powertrains don't need wireless. However, they're really boring if you don't have connectivity. Because what's the point of having an autonomous vehicle that you can't monitor or you can't summon to come get you? It's just kind of boring. So connectivity is really important just for that human aspect of for being able to have really great services but also something Colin was talking about, managing your range anxiety and being able to figure out how are you going to plan those trips? Because as we do know, we've already talked about a lot, how different it is between an EV and an internal combustion engine. But connectivity offers a lot of things that we've been doing for decades, which is safety. So we know that when you add connectivity to a vehicle, yes, it's true, this can be considered uh, like a car and wheels, except this cannot and doesn't necessarily kill you where a vehicle does. So in the event of a collision, what when you were talking about um, Cadillac, they have a system called OnStar that actually delivers remote information back and forth in the event of a, of a collision and serves emergency services for you. That works in a lot of different ways. It also helps not just with those tragic situations, but also for things like fleet maintenance and being able to keep those, those vehicles on the road highly utilized. It's not adding more vehicles, it's about better utilization. And you're not gonna do that if you don't know the vehicle's condition state and you're not able to really plan for it. So connectivity is an enabler. And I think it's really important to understand that. So with that, um, I think I'm going to skip over and kind of go to a little bit of a different thread here and then kind of go ask the panelists here and I'll leave it open. Um, what kind of excites you the most about the future of electric vehicles? And, or and or the future of ele an electric vehicle ecosystem and why. So any thoughts there? I think um, I think all of us, all three of us have plenty of thoughts. So uh, we're not short on thoughts, <laughs> Monica. Sure. Um, you know, um, you know, as where uh, Michelle was finishing off with uh, OnStar uh, and then uh, maybe even touching a little bit on Dev talking about Dubai. 
Um, I, I've had the opportunity to spend some time in uh, another place, which I think is a global leader, that's Singapore. Um, and they're able to make quick decisions and move very quickly. And, and they are on both autonomous as well as the uh, air charging infrastructure and electrification of their island city. But, um, you know, as we get to five, uh, level five, and let's, let's you know, honestly, I, I'm, 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 a, I'm, a, I'm a dreamer and I'm hoping we're going to be there in the next decade. Um, there is a great publication by KPMG from April of 2017 called The Islands of Autonomy. You know, it's really worth a, a read if you haven't, um, because their their perception of autonomy and how it unfolds is in the downtown cores of major cities. For example, Chicago, L.A., Toronto, Ottawa. They feel that, you know, the connectivity that's required for multiple vehicles to 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 maneuver and to maneuver safely will probably best be applied to this downtown core and then bleed outwards to suburbia. I, I live in a place called Caledon. It's uh, a bit more rural than other parts of the greater Toronto area. And uh, we have at least eight blackout zones here where there's zero Wi-Fi, you know, forget 5G or even 4G. And so as we imagine this world and what gets me excited is this kind of level five autonomy. Uh, and and we're working on Project Arrow with something we've coined VAAC, which is vehicle as a caregiver. So we're saying now, if you're in a vehicle that's at level four or level five and you're being driven around and there's no other living entity in this vehicle and you have a health issue, then the vehicle's intelligence, um, its biometric sensory technologies that's been in, that have been embedded, the hardware and the software, um, should make sure that caregiving is provided for that loved one that is being transported, whether it's five kilometers or whether it's 500 kilometers, to make sure that caregiving is 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 given. And, and one of the hurdles and challenges there is regulation uh, and policies to make sure that can do, because I'm, I'm sure all four of us could agree that um, sensory technologies are available today. But then we start to imagine the form shape a shifting on a on a on a bit of no longer needs to meet the same CFMVSS or FMVSS requirements. You know, if we've reduced that 94 or 97% human error rate right down to, you know, the teens, you know, now you're talking about plastic cars. You don't have to have the crumple zones. You, you know, it, it suddenly changes what the, the, the vehicle looks like today because, you know, it, it can materials and i and i think michelle mentioned it you know and you know I, I i absolutely would say a circular economy model should be embraced early on you know just like vehicle uh, security by design we should embrace that circular economy economy model for clean tech now move away from that linear model and see how we can kind of strengthen that as we go because as we get to these plastic materials they're not really plastic they're using lignin natural fibers. You know, they're not using nylons that don't recycle too well. And, and, and so all of that over the, the course of the next 10 to 20 years is what gets me excited. Great. Oh, what I could do is I, I want to share an angle for, for the audience where electrification is part of the picture. So when you think about it, you get electric cars. Um, you don't... Um, well, for now, in general, uh, you go get energy, your fuel for your electric car from the grid. So your gas station becomes a grid instead of your traditional gas station. Now, what does this potentially mean? If you look at it from the big picture, um, if we look at our world at large, the, uh, the countries that are energy rich uh, inherently have a, 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 have a natural advantage in, in wealth creation, right? So if, if, you, if you got oil, you got your natural advantage in wealth creation. And what's happening with all of this renewable and energy generation, it's giving a whole slew of co countries, provinces, states, a chance to become much more energy rich. Now, the electrification of transportation just basically drives the, uh, drives the demand for creating more energy coming through the grid from renewable sources. Because it's kind of like brain dead to burn oil to put energy on your grid to then fill up your electric vehicles with, right? That's not really the, the idea here. So what I'm excited about is 
suddenly all of the volume, all of the joules of energy that are come, that come through our gas station come through the grid, which means more onboarding of renewable energy into the system, which also means that countries get more incentives to deploy on the other side, these renewable energy technologies, namely large amounts of wind and solar, and uh, become less dependent on, on big oil. And less dependent on big oil basically kind of liberates many countries from their oil dependency shackles. Um, and so Kevin, I just, we're going to have to cut now. <laughs> we're out of time. <laughs> Michelle, do you have a 15 second pitch we can go with? <laughs> I do, I do. But I'm really excited about making the future now, not waiting. I'm really mm -hmm. patient. And so I'm ready for it now. And I'm really happy that it can ride. We can deliver on that. Thank you so much. Thank you, Sonia. And, uh, Everyone at, Bay at Invest Ottawa and Area X. <laughs> with all of you in different ways, Colin, of course, through our relationship with Avon as one of the partners in that network. So great to see you. Michelle, the work with you done with the forum and Unride, and I look forward to seeing you next month directly. Monica, one of the founding partners of Center and Dev, one of our scaling companies that works closely with our venture team. Thank you all so much for your incredible insight and a really vigorous discussion. It was simply excellent. Thank you. Look across all the different <laughs> opportunities and challenges that we hear about on a very regular basis. Talent is one that emerges very consistently. If you are a company anywhere in tech in this global mobile world that we now live in, the attraction, development, and retention of talent becomes more challenging and more novel approaches are required. What better way than to look for those new novel solutions and strategies and to bring together the director of our award-winning talent team, Natalie MacArthur, my 